please keep in mind that these guidelines continue to shift and evolve as the weeks pass. So our panelists will be discussing where things stand as of today. Each speaker has provided contact information so that you can get updates as things change. I'd like to thank Delegate Chunika Henson for co-sponsoring this important discussion as so many face the potential of eviction and for her continued advocacy on behalf of our community. A special thanks to Phoebe Duff and Emily Ligham for chairing this event and for Jean-Tel Green and Amy Britt who are behind the scenes making the magic happen so that we can all watch this from our homes. I'd like to now introduce our moderator, the Reverend Dr. Carletta Allen, Senior Pastor at Asbury United Methodist Church. Reverend Allen has been a good friend and partner to Action Annapolis and does a great service to our community by moderating events like this one that provide us with critical information. Thank you, Reverend Allen, and good evening to you. Thank you, Sonia, and good evening to you too. Good evening to all of you out there. I am indeed broadcasting live from Asbury, right in the heart of town. It is good to be here with you this evening. I wish it was under different circumstances, don't you? This country has been going through a season since March, a season of social unrest, a season of economic unrest, a season of medical unrest. There's unrest all around. And in the midst of all of that, we are in an economic crisis related to the healthcare crisis. And this evening, we hope that you will take away from this time together actionable items, that you will have answers to questions. It is unconscionable to think of how many people may be on the cusp of losing their housing, which will only exacerbate the issues in our community right now with regard to social distancing and all of that. So we have a lot to talk about. We're gonna get right to it. And we are going to begin uh, with Delegate Henson, who is um, of course co-sponsoring this event. She represents the state of Maryland in District 30A, and she is going to discuss the existing and upcoming legislation impacting housing and evictions. So this may not be laws on the books now, but there are more coming. So Delegate Henson, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allen, and thank you, Action Annapolis, for hosting this important forum. I want to encourage everyone that's tuned in to share this video. If this message is going to help you, share the video. If it's going to help someone that you know, share the video. If it will help someone that you care about stay in their housing or find ways to navigate the anxiety surrounding what's happening right now with housing, share this video so that it reaches the most wide audience as possible. My task tonight is letting you know what's on the horizon. So to do that effectively, I'm going to share my screen, which has a slideshow prepared with some things that are important to know. The journey that I'll take you on with the slides here is looking at legislation that's upcoming for this coming session. For first to do that, we have to look at what we have on the books right now. Right now, we're straddled between two moratoriums. We have the Maryland eviction moratorium that was issued by the governor's executive order. And what that says is until the state of emergency is terminated, that the courts cannot give a judgment for possession of property. So that means that they can't physically turn someone out on the street. Legal aid is on the line and they're gonna to explain to you all the things that that includes and the things that it doesn't include and how you can navigate that court process. We also have at the same time, the federal moratorium from DHS and CDC. What that says is that it temporarily halts evictions for people who are eligible under the order if they follow certain steps. So again, I'll put a plug in for legal aid, which is on the line and they'll help you to navigate that as well if you think you might be covered under the federal moratorium. And in terms of evictions for the state of Maryland, what we have on the horizon is one bill that's introduced by Delegate Janelle Wilkins. It'll be a refile. She filed the bill last year. Its number was HB 821. So you'll want to keep an eye out for a different number this year. But that bill is just cause evictions. And that means unless the landlord has a just cause, they can't choose not to renew someone's lease. They can't just evict somebody simply because they don't want to have a person continue to stay in the property and get a new lease. 
They have to have a reason why we're having that disruption in housing. So just cause evictions is a bill you'll wanna look out for this session. We know that having stability in housing is very important during COVID-19 because people moving from place to place is one of the ways that the virus transmits. So this bill is gonna have greater significance this session than it had even last session when it was a great bill just standing alone. Um, two bills that deal with rental housing quality. One of the things that we've seen over the pandemic is that inspections haven't been able to happen at the same pace that they were happening pre-COVID. So that oversight, that layer to make sure that the quality of rental housing is maintained hasn't been there as strongly as it was before. So there's two bills that'll be looking at housing quality. There's one bill by myself, indoor air quality, which will put in place statewide standards for mold detection and remediation. That'll be a refile as well. When I filed it last year, it was HB 1540. So you'll wanna look out for the refile if having statewide standards for mold remediation is something that you're interested in bringing to the landscape here in Maryland. Also, there's an excellent bill by Delegate Melissa Wells. She's a delegate out of Baltimore City. And she had a bill that had a lot of really great pieces in it. And the crux of it was an implied warranty of habitability. And that means that if you sign a lease with somebody, it would be presumed that the property you were leasing was a property that you could live in so that it was free from mold. It didn't have any dangerous defects. It was a property that was gonna be quality. So once you shift that burden and you put an implied warranty of habitability in the code, it's then on your landlord to see, to make sure they've upheld those standards. And if they haven't, to show cause to the court why they have not. Another part of that bill would allow residents to put their money into rent escrow. And then also the courts would have the unique feature of being able to look at the rent that you agreed to in your lease and to determine what is a reasonable rent under the circumstances, given the quality and condition of your rental housing. And once they determine reasonable rent, the courts can make a calculation on if you're owed a refund of any of the rent that you have paid. So that bill has a lot of really unique features that would really raise the standard on how we are determining what's quality rental housing in Maryland. It was filed last year as HB 1372. So if you're interested in that, you'll wanna look out for it this year again on a refile from Delegate Wells. And then the last section of bills, if I had to categorize them, we've gone through existing eviction protections. We've gone through rental housing quality. And the last section I call consumer protections. And there are three bills I wanna highlight here. One is shielding eviction records. I'm filing that bill, that's will filed by yours truly. And that bill is going to state that if a person has an eviction case that's on the books and it's been filed, they could petition the court to have those records removed from public access so that people can't see that and hold it against them. If your case went to court and you were found to not have um, found in your favor and not in the landlord's favor, the court would have to automatically remove that record within 30 days. And then there's also some protections on there on if you did have a judgment against you, how you could petition a few years down the road to get that off your record as well. There's another one by Delegate Vaughn Stewart, who he filed last year, and he'll be filing that again. It's a great delegate out of Montgomery County. And that was HB 744. And that was kind of a, a omnibus protection, uh, slate of protections for our tenants. That one says that your landlord couldn't report it to your credit rating agencies if you failed to pay your rent. It had some protections for late fees. And what he wants to do this year is add in there prohibiting late fees from accruing during the COVID-19 pandemic. So he's gonna make some revisions to that to update it for the times that we're in currently, but that one had a real slate of resources to protect our renters, to make sure that they didn't have adverse credit consequences or other impacts if they fell behind in rent. And then the third one I'll go into is being proposed by Delegate Mary Lehman, who's a delegate who represents Anne Arundel and Prince George's County. So if you're up in the Odenton area, if you're up in that area, Delegate Mary Lehman may be your delegate. This one would prohibit landlords from using certain types of information to screen tenants. We understand that when we raise the bar on protections, that what happens sometimes is it has the negative consequences of landlords uh, wanting to cherry pick their tenants and really being super specific about who they'll rent property to because they get a little gun shy on, you know, am I gonna get a good tenant or not? 
So what Delegate Lehman tried to do with this bill is to make sure that we're looking at the right things, things that will give tenants a fair shot when landlords are deciding who am I going to rent my property to and who's not going to be a good candidate for me. So that bill will be introduced by Delegate Lehman. My bill for evictions, shielding of the records, and Delegate Lehman's bill, those are still in drafting. Those weren't introduced last session, so those will be new bills, and you can look out for the number. So when I say look out for the bill number, what does that mean? That means if you are interested in supporting any of this legislation, you have the opportunity to get involved. And I've included the four steps there on how you can get involved. You can contact the bill sponsor so that they can help you stay up to date with the bill's steps in the process. Each of the bills will have a hearing before their committee that it's assigned to. This year, it's gonna be a little different for session. Each of the committees will provide at least 48 hours notice to the member that's sponsoring the bill and also to the public as well. After that notice is provided, the public would have the opportunity to submit written testimony electronically, or you would have the opportunity to sign up to testify electronically. And those are big changes from sessions in past, but we have to make those changes to make sure that the public's safe and that the members are safe during these unprecedented times. So if you're interested in testifying in support of any of these bills or testifying in general, you're welcome to do so. You can sign up to testify online or you can upload your written testimony. Those are steps three and four. So that's what's on the horizon for rental housing legislation. So a few other great pieces of policy, but in the interest of time, I wanted to pick for you all those um, ones that I think are going to have really great impact here in the state of Maryland. And if you're inclined to lend your support, you can reach out to any of the delegates that have been mentioned. They'd be happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate, and thank you also for that information about becoming part of the political process. Next, we will hear from Jonathan Riedel. He is a legal fellow at CASA, Immigrant Advocacy and Services Organization. Uh, his talk will focus on housing and immigration issues that CASA members are facing, discussing how we can navigate evictions and accessing emergency rental assistance for immigrants. It is important that all who are with us know their legal rights, regardless of their status. So thank you much, Mr. Riedel. Thank you. And I will just uh, share my screen here real quick so we can see the presentation. Um, this is, oh, sorry about that. Let's try that again. All right, can we all see that? Um, this is uh, just a quick, presentation, you'll see that it's, I'm going to do it all in English, but it's there in Spanish too for any of our people here who are our viewers who might be um, interested in having it in Spanish. Uh, so um, what I just wanted to cover today is, is a lot of people are confused about what the state of the courts is and whether they can be evicted, whether their rents can be raised, um, their utilities, and whether the landlord still has obligations to uh, fix things in their apartment. Um, and there's lots of rumors going around and um, we wanna try and um, sort that out. The first question is the most important though. Um, can I be evicted? Everyone wants to know um, whether they can be evicted. So we're gonna talk about that most. Um, when you're trying to figure out whether you can be evicted, you have to ask yourself two questions. Have I had a substantial loss of income due to the pandemic? This is obviously very important to, the, to our current situation. Um, and the second is, why does my landlord want to evict me? Um, because there's different protections depending on why your landlord is trying to evict you. Is it because you haven't paid rent? Is it because um, you breached some condition of your lease, like maybe you had a dog when you weren't supposed to? Um, is it because you uh, just stayed, you don't have a, a, a formal contract anymore? And there's different um, rules for each one. And we're gonna walk through those. So the first question is, have I had a substantial loss of income due to the pandemic? And that's important because um, if you have, then there's other protections for you. If you have not, if you're still working and you're still worried about evictions, maybe um, you had some sort of other emergency, the car broke down, um, but you managed to keep your job, 
um, you still have rights. You still have to go to court um, to, to get evicted. That's really important. No one, there's no self-help evictions in Maryland, which means that your landlord can't just come and say, hey, you haven't paid rent, knock on your door and, and uh, change the locks. They can't do that. They have to go to court no matter who you are. Um, if you, if you have a landlord tenant relationship, um, right? So the, the question though is, have you suffered a, a substantial loss of income? If you've lost uh, hours, if you lost your job, that's probably substantial. We don't know exactly what that means in all circumstances. Um, so, you know, that still tends to be worked out in the courts, but generally people kind of know if they've had a substantial loss of income. I gave some examples here. If you lost you know, one job one time as a contractor, that's probably not substantial. But if you lost you know, half of your work or you lost big jobs, um, that can be substantial, right? So like I said, that's important um, because other protections might be available to you. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But this other question, um, why does my landlord want to evict me? That is really important because there's different protections available. Um, then there's basically three types of um, reasons that a landlord might want to evict. Uh, there's a fourth one called wrongful de detainer, but that's more like squatters, and we're not going to talk about that. Um, it's, it's generally rare if people are talking about being evicted. Um, so these three are the main ones. It's failure to pay rent, and I would estimate that that's the vast majority, 80 to 90 percent of the cases. Um, people just can't pay their rent, and um, landlords want to to collect on that. The second is breach of lease. Like I said, it's uh, damaging the property. Maybe you, did, you had a dog when you weren't supposed to. Um, criminal activity sometimes. Maybe you made alterations that you weren't supposed to do. That, that's pretty rare, um, generally speaking. Uh, people do do it. Uh, but if you're going to court, it's probably for failure to pay rent or this third one, which is holding over. And a holdover means you are staying beyond the, beyond the end of the lease term, or maybe you're a month to month tenant. So you um, just said, I'm gonna stay here for six months and you paid your landlord and then you were just on a month to month for a while. And they decide, you know what? I don't wanna do this relationship anymore. I wanna take back the apartment. Uh, then they could evict you for holding over even though you've been paying your rent on time every month. So um, this is important because as uh, the delegate mentioned, we have um, uh, various protections depending on uh, which one it is. So the failure to pay rent, you can take advantage of either the state moratorium or the federal moratorium, the CDC moratorium. And you might want to decide which one is better for you. Um, I, I've listed here some examples. You know, the state one lasts longer. It lasts until the emergency ends. So if you are really worried about paying your rent up through February and March, you'd wanna take advantage of it. Um, you don't need to declare anything, but you need to have some general proof to show that you've had a substantial loss of income. That's why that first question was so important. Um, for the CDC one, you, you can just declare it. You say, I've had a substantial loss of income. Um, I, I, there's various requirements. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but um, most people meet those requirements um, pretty easily. Um, if they've been trying to make rental payments and they don't have enough income to pay their rent, it's right now it's only lasting until December. So we need to be a little bit on the lookout for that, but you just have to submit a declaration. Here's the big important thing that happened last week. If you, if your landlord is trying to evict you for failure to pay rent, there are no failure to pay rent hearings gonna be scheduled until the new year. That's the wisdom that we have as of um, this week. Um, like, uh, uh, like we've been saying, they, things change all the time. So um, last week they issued this announcement. It went into effect on Monday, which is yesterday, <laughs> that um, if your landlord is trying to evict you, it's not gonna be scheduled. You know, They can still file it. They can still send you a notice but uh, it won't be heard until the new year. And that's mostly, that's just because of the COVID cases that are on the rise and they wanna keep the courts not so packed. Um, so that's really good. And like I said, you can, you can have either of these two state or federal protections. Now, if it's one of these other two, if it's a breach of lease or if it's a holding over, 
uh, if it's a breach of lease, you can't get the CDC protection. This is only for failure to pay rent cases. Um, and it's if you're holding over, as far as I'm aware, there's no spe COVID related specific protections uh, for it because both of these orders um, apply to failure to pay rent cases. So you have fewer defenses. Um, but again, like if you're in this position, um, there's, there's uh, legal aid, which we have a representative here from legal aid. Um, and there's other attorneys uh, who can try and na help you navigate that as well. That's in Spanish. Um, so the big important, the know your rights that I say in every, you know, write this down. I say this in every, every presentation. Your landlord cannot evict you without a court order. Your landlord cannot evict you without a court order. You know, a lot of people think, you know, they, they sent me a letter and the letter said I have to leave by the by December 15th. I don't know how what I'm going to do. I guess I'll I'll go live in my car. That's not true. You know, you you have to go to court. Um, you'll get a, a notice in the mail that'll or, or sometimes at your door, sometimes delivered to you personally, and it looks very formal and it has a date and a time that you would go to the court. Um, so, like I said, if 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 it's one of those reasons the failure to pay rent, the holding over, the breach of lease, then you go to court. If they simply say, um, I don't want you here anymore, and they don't give a reason, they can't evict you. you they have to have a specific reason, um, and it's going to be on that court form. So that's important to remember. Of course, you always have to show up to court if, they, if you're called there, but um, we'll get to that. Um, and then this is a, your rights as a tenant if you test positive. You know, we've been, we heard especially earlier in the pandemic that people were saying, um, I was diagnosed with COVID-19 and my landlord told me I had to take a, a test and um, I, I'm a danger to other tenants, so I have to inform him. That's not true. You don't have to inform your landlord or other residents if you test positive. Um, obviously you want to stay in your home. The, the public health guidance is that you should quarantine and stay there. So it doesn't make much sense for your landlord to be telling you to leave and go out and do other things. Um, and you can't be evicted under what's called the imminent danger law. You know, if, you have, if you're an imminent danger to the surrounding um, tenants, then there's like a ex expedited, a speeded up, a sped up process. But that's not true for COVID-19. They can't use that to say you should be evicted. Um, and then this last one, your rights uh, as, as a tenant. This is what I was saying before. Earlier this summer, there was a temporary ban on evictions and the courts were closed. Then they reopened. Now they're back down to limited capacity. They went phase one, phase two, all the way up to phase five. Now they're back to phase three. So there's lots of rumors going around, lots of gossip saying, well, I heard that the courts were closed. Some people saying, no, the courts are open. The answer is it's, it's very confusing. Um, sometimes they were closed and sometimes they weren't. And now we're back down to limited capacity. So as I mentioned before, they're not hearing failure to pay rent cases until at least January 1st, um, even though they can be filed. And they are hearing these other types of cases, holdover breach of lease, but they're hearing fewer cases per docket because they want to limit the overcrowding. So that means you have more months. You know, If someone says you have to leave by next week, that's not, that's not true probably, generally, because um, it's gonna take a few months for the process and the courts to work out, okay? And then this important thing I always say, always show up to court. Right now, we're not sure, um, you know, with, you might not be sure whether you have a court date or not because everything is changing. So they will send you a new notice if you have to show up. Um, you can always call the court to find out. Uh, just simply ask with your case, number do I need to show up on Thursday or whatever and uh, and you should be uh, good to go but if you do have a court date it's important that you show up because otherwise you could lose automatically um, I just wanted to show, share this quick story um, one of one of our clients received threatening letters saying eviction was imminent this is the kind of the letter that they got um, it says you know if you don't pay pay within four days you're going to be evicted okay this is not true. They can, they can send you all the letters they want. They might be filing cases immediately after, but they will not be evicting you in four days. Um, so be careful of that. You'll get a more formal summons. Um, the summons looks like this. I don't know if we can try to connect to the internet here. 
Um, but the legal process begins with a summon. And I think, I think Kathleen will be talking a little bit more about this, but it looks like this. It's a very formal um, document and it has all this stuff and the, the, tri the trial date will appear up here in this box. So don't be fooled. Um, very quickly, we'll talk about, uh, can they raise my rent? Um, as far as I know, there's some, there's in, in Arundel County, there's a, a rent restriction at 3%. Um, I don't practice in, in Arundel County all that much. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sure of all the details of it, but this is my understanding of it. I'm happy to be corrected if that's wrong. Um, but that's the situation because of the pandemic beginning August 22nd. Utilities is a thorny question. A lot of people are talking about um, utility cutoffs and uh, late fees and things like that. Um, as of November 15th, which is just two days ago, they can cut off your utilities if you're behind. However, we've been hearing that they say they are not going to do that. They want you to make a payment plan, however. They want you to call them, talk to them about your ability. If you don't have work, that's totally understandable but they, they don't wanna cut it off. They want, to, they want to work with you. So be sure to call your utility company as soon as possible so that you don't get it turned off on you. Um, and then the last question here is, can I still make them make repairs? And the short answer is yes, of course. Um, you know, you have the obligation to pay rent and they have the obligation to uh, fix your home. But just because you don't pay rent on time doesn't mean they have to, they, they get to abandon all of their responsibilities. They still have to repair um, things that are dangerous. Your sink is overflowing. There's mold in the apartment. You have to notify them or you, you may notify them and uh, they'll have to fix it for you. And those are, are pretty normal um, states of the law. So, uh, and then I think I'll, I'll leave it there and we'll have some, some question and answer later. Um, to answer all of your questions. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And Kathleen Hughes will continue the conversation. She is a staff attorney with Maryland Legal Aid, and she's going to help us understand eviction court proceedings. Uh, she's going to help us know how to prepare for and go through an eviction proceeding so that we can have the best possible outcome. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. Thank you and hello everyone. Um, very pleased to be here. I'm gonna share my screen now. This is a little bit of a learning process for me. So bear with me for a moment. And um, so let's get right to it. A lot of the things that Jonathan talked about, um, I'm gonna expand on. Um, he did a great job of giving just sort of a, a, a good overview and I'm gonna to try to, to expand on that. So um, I'm not gonna be getting into the breach of lease cases because they are much more complex. There's different rules that apply to breach of lease. And um, there are breach of lease cases happening now. You, um, under the COVID-19 rules, you can be evicted for breach of lease, but there are some, um, they are covered under the governor's order. So if you've had a substantial loss of income, breach of lease is covered under that. So you may be protected. So I just wanna get that out there um, first and foremost. So for failure to pay rents, and as Jonathan said, they really are 80 to 90% of the cases that we're gonna be seeing, that you're gonna be seeing. Um, these are the elements of a failure to pay rent case and what um, a landlord has to show. A uh, landlord has to show that a landlord-tenant relationship exists, which means that um, basically you're giving money or you're paying or um, there's an agreement for you to be a tenant in a, a particular residence. The landlord has to show that you failed to pay your rent and that, that the rent that you failed to pay um, and the late fees are still due and owing and the landlord wants to repossess the premises. Interestingly, um, in failure to pay rent cases, the, the case is not about, um, well, it is about trying to collect rent, but it is a, a, um, an action for possession of the property. So the landlord says, well, you didn't pay your rent. I want my property back. And there are ways if, um, if you can 
um, keep from giving the property back if you come back and pay your rent, which we'll talk about in a moment. So, um, the land, so the landlord's remedies in a failure to pay rent case are that they get to get the premises back, um, that um, the rent due and or the rent due and owing at the time and or of hearing plus the late fees. And remember that late fees can be no more than 5% of your rent. If you're in subsidized housing, that means 5% of your portion of the rent. Um, the landlord can also request future rent that became due between the time of filing and the date of the trial, which just means that um, if a landlord, for example, fi files a case late in the month in October, on October 28th for October's rent, they can also request November's rent because between the time that the uh, case is filed and the case is gonna be heard, um, then that additional rent will become due and owing for November. Tenants have certain defenses in landlord tenant cases and these are the most common ones. The tenant paid the rent, so then the landlord can't follow through in the failure to pay rent case. The amount of rent claimed in the complaint is wrong and or the landlord included charges that are not rent. Failure to pay rent case, a landlord can only charge for rent. It is not an action to bring charges for damages. It's not an action to bring charges for utilities. It's only for the rent due, um, which is a really important distinction. A lot of landlords um, do try to collect that other fees as part of the rent and um, they can only collect for rent. In Maryland, um, if, you're, if you live in a jurisdiction which requires a valid rental property license, then the landlord has to have that rental property license in order to, to sue you in landlord tenant court. Um, Anne Arundel County and the city of Annapolis are both jurisdictions which require a valid rental property license. Uh, you can check to see if the property is licensed. If it's not licensed, the landlord cannot bring that action. And in a minute, I'm gonna go back and try to pull up the failure to pay rent form so that I can show you on the form where these things are, are laid out so that you can check your, the, um, the summons that you get. Um, if a landlord lacks a valid lead inspection certificate, we don't see this, this as much in um, Anne Arundel County. Um, I know that it's a big one in the city of Baltimore. And then um, if the premises contains threats to the, to the life, health or safety of the tenant, that is also a defense in a failure to pay rent case. Now you should be paying your rent anyway, and you can file a separate action that's called rent escrow, where you can ask the court to place your rent into a separate account until the landlord gets the, um, gets the, the problems sorted out. But the problems have to be severe. It can't be that you know, there's um, a little you know, drafty window or there's a mark on the wall. The problem has to be a life-threatening condition in order to um, qualify for rent escrow which is what really interested me, hearkening back to Delegate Henson's presentation on the legislation um, that's being proposed around conditions, because it seems to me that the standard would not necessarily have to be a life-threatening standard, but if the property is in bad condition, that you can also file a rent escrow. So these are new defenses under COVID-19. And I just wanna stress that before the Governor Hogan's order last March, you could not come to court and say, I lost my job and therefore I can't pay my rent. Now you can, and you can do that because of COVID. So it is a new defense for a failure to pay rent case under, um, uh, under the Governor Hogan's order. So if you lost income due to COVID-19 and, um, uh, these are some examples of those um, of the income lost, and I would I would say that you can you want to look at this very broadly. There are a lot of hidden losses of income that may not be I just lost my job or I lost hours on my job, but things like needing to miss work to care for a school age child, or there's there are other um, things that can constitute a loss of income due to COVID-19. Uh, under this order, the court may require the tenant to testify or to present evidence to prove that you lost your income due to the pandemic. 
And as um, Jonathan said, the um, eviction, if the court grants you a moratorium under this, um, under the governor's order, then the eviction is prohibited until actually it lasts 30 days after the state of emergency is lifted. And we're still in a state of emergency. We don't know yet when that's going to be lifted. I want to stress that it doesn't relieve the tenant of the obligation to pay rent. It just delays the judgment for the eviction. So you want to be trying to pay that rent if you can, if you can make that work. The other new defense under the CDC's emergency order, this is another new defense and the tenant um, has to meet these requirements. It's a temporary halt in residential evictions until right now until December 31st. And that's the other one that, that Jonathan was talking about. So I'm gonna run through really quickly. These are the things that, that are required. There's an affidavit that you, um, that you fill out or a declaration that you fill out and you have to give to your landlord. It says you've made best efforts to obtain all available government assistance for rent. Um, Lisa Saro is gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Um, she's, there's some programs, there's some county programs that can help you with that. Um, you have to be low income um, under 99,000 in annual income for 2020 or 198,000 if you're filing a joint return with your spouse. You have to be unable to pay the full rent due because of substantial loss. And this is household income. And I also want to stress household income. I had a case recently where the, my client had not uh, seen a reduction in income because she was on SSI. However, she had a subletter who had lost income due to the pandemic. And so we were able to get her a reprieve under the CDC moratorium. Um, you have to use your best efforts to make timely partial payments. If you don't have any money to make partial payments, you don't have the money to make partial payments, but you wanna try if you can, because again, the, the rent is going to come due at some point. Um, you have to say that, you, or you have to be likely to become homeless or need to move into a new residence that have, that it's gonna be shared by a lot of other people in close quarters, not a lot, other people in close, close quarters. The whole point of this is to try to alleviate the spread of the disease. So uh, they, the CDC doesn't want you moving into a home where you're gonna be crammed in with other people and, and uh, spreading the disease or at risk of having the disease spread. You have to say that you understand that the rent is still owed. And you have to say that you understand that on December 31st, the housing provider can require payment in full. So this is another six weeks under the CDC order, but if you don't meet the requirements under the government, governor's order, you certainly want to do to sign the declaration to give yourself some time. Um, and this is how you go about doing it. Now I did put, I don't know if I click on this link if I can get back to the slide, but there is a link here that gets you right to that declaration. It's a one page form and you sign it and take it to your landlord. You can do it at any time. In my particular case, we did it in the courtroom in front of the judge. Um, the landlord refused to take it and the judge directed the landlord to take it and said, I'm sorry, you have to take the declaration. So, um, after they receive the declaration, they can't take any further action to evict. Okay, I've got in here that that's sub, uh, subject to interpretation because further action to evict could be going in and filing for a warrant of restitution. The um, court may say that's not covered. So, but they cannot take any further action to evict. And if they do, call us, call Maryland Legal Aid or try to get um, legal help, maybe at one of the self-help centers and we can try to answer your specific questions. This ends on December 31st. And again, it does not relieve the tenant of the obligation to pay the rent. I wanna walk you through the hearing really quickly and I don't know how I'm doing on time. So I hope somebody is watching that for me. <laughs> I know we don't have a lot. So these hearings are scheduled really fast. Anne Arundel County takes pride in the fact that they're usually scheduled within a week. Other jurisdictions, that's not the case, but here in Anne Arundel County, they get those notices posted really quickly. Um, Service for a failure to pay rent hearing is, it just has to be posted on your door and mailed to you. So you're gonna see that it's gonna be taped to your door by the sheriff. And that sometimes happens the day before the hearing. So it happens fast. Um, you do, because we're in the pandemic, you do have a right to appear remotely. It might be really difficult if you get your notice the night before and the hearing scheduled for the next day, it's gonna be difficult 
to contact the court and say, I want a remote hearing, but I would encourage you to do that if you can't make it the next morning. Just backing up for a moment, because we're in phase three and I'm gonna come back to that, there are not failure to pay rent hearings happening right now. They're not gonna be happening until after December 31st, as was covered by Jonathan. So this is in the general scheme of things, it's not, um, but that's not happening right now. When you get to the courthouse, the court's gonna call the case and they, they just say, you know, um, different judges do it different ways, but they will call the, the case number and that, and the landlord will walk up and they'll call your name. Um, the landlord's supposed at that point to present evidence that rent is due and owing. It usually just consists of the landlord saying, yes, they owe $1,200 in rent. Um, and then the judge will generally ask the tenant if the tenant agrees that they owe that amount. And this was your opportunity to raise any of the defenses that we talked about before and any supporting evidence you might have. And we're gonna talk about what to take to court in a minute. Um, the court's gonna make a determination if the rent is due and owing based on the evidence and how much. And the court's gonna also look to see if the landlord complied with the laws and rules to obtain judgment. If somebody comes in and they don't have a, a license and you raise that they don't have a license, then they can't sue you that day. <laughs> so the, the court's gonna look at that to determine if the landlord complied with the law. If the landlord just doesn't show up to court, the case is automatically dismissed. If you fail to show up to court and the landlord is there, then the landlord, I say, say you may win by default, but 9.9 .9 times out of 10, the landlord is gonna win by default because the court has not heard from you. So all the court has to go by is what the landlord has said to them. That's testimony, it's evidence, and the court can take the, the, court can take the landlord at their word. So do go to court, do go to court. Um, these are the things you might wanna bring with you to court. Any court papers that you received, a copy of the complaint, um, and I, I'm gonna pull that up in a minute, a copy of your lease, all your rental receipts. The landlord may get there and say, they haven't paid me for the last six months. And you come in and you say, judge, I have all these receipts from the last six months. Um, if you're raising the COVID-19 defense, proof of loss of income due to COVID-19, and these are some examples, unemployment checks, a termination letter, any reduced check stubs, anything like that. Remember too that that testimony, am I going to, to um, too long here, Reverend Allen, or I'm good? You have a little more time. Okay, all right, I'm almost done. So um, um, so the testimony is also evidence and the, the judge does look at your credibility when you're telling your story. So that is also evidence. So even if you may not have documentary evidence, if you tell your story, the judge is gonna listen to you and that is also evidence. Bring all the correspondence between you and your landlord. Bring a copy of your CDC declaration if you gave that to your landlord or if you intend to give it to your landlord at court. Photos or video um, and a list of conditions and of course a pen and paper so that you can take notes. If you lose, you have four days within, to, within which you can appeal the failure to pay rent decision after that judgment. The judges will usually set a bond but you can ask for it to be waived. A tenant can also file a motion for a new hearing or a motion to alter or amend the judgment within 10, 10 to 30 days. Um, and at this stage, we recommend that you seek legal advice. So I'm not gonna um, be going through all of these, the um, warrant of restitution and notice of eviction because we don't have time, but please do look over the, um, the rest of the slides here, the defenses for um, tenant holding over, but I do wanna give you your takeaways, go to court. <laughs> There's not a blanket eviction right now. It's a temporary halt on evictions. You have to meet the requirements. Seek financial assistance to pay your rent and seek legal advice if you have questions. Please, please, please. Thank you very much. This is our contact information and we look forward to hearing from you if you have any issues, any legal issues, we're happy to assist you. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Hughes. And we will hear from another attorney. Uh, Lisa Saro is the general counsel for the Arundel Community Development Services. And she's going to help us understand um, how to prevent evictions by negotiating agreements with the landlord or, and or the tenant. Uh, she'll give us an overview of eviction prevention 
assistance for tenants whose household income has been affected by this pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Saro. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight and um, with, with all these familiar faces that I see on the screen tonight. Um, and I am going to share my screen and um, let's get to screen two. All right. So is, it, is my screen up? Just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay, so Anne Arundel, um, or Arundel Community Development Services is the nonprofit arm of Anne Arundel County. Um, the program that we are working on right now um, due to the COVID pandemic is at the eviction prevention program, which um, is not just providing financial assistance, but also is providing resources to county residents. Um, the program is funded with Anne Arundel County general funds, video lottery, lottery terminal funds up there from Maryland Live, um, community development block grant funds, and CARES Act funds. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the importance of those CARES Act funds um, as we move along. So the, let's get to the next one. Um, if you are falling behind on your rent, you need to take action. I think many people seem to believe that because these moratoria are in effect, that they can look the other way or ignore the fact that they're falling behind on rent. And I get it, it's really stressful. It's a scary time, but this is not a time that you can um, put your head in the sand and not do something. If you're falling behind, you need to take action. If the CDC declaration applies to you, then get that CDC de declaration and give it to your landlord. Use that declaration. It will prevent eviction at least through December 31st. And you know, um, hopefully it will be extended. We don't know yet, but it may be extended. Um, you can find a copy of the CDC order on the ACDS website. We have it with a handy little Q&A info um, sheet that I drafted up. Um, and you're free to download it from there, sign it, use it. Um, you need to contact your, your landlord or your property manager as soon as you know you're gonna fall behind. Um, keep lines of communication open. If your landlord knows what's going on and knows that you're trying, they're much more likely to work with you. Um, and seek eviction prevention assistance early, apply for programs, contact ACDS or our partners. And I'm gonna give you the contact info at the end um, so that you can reach out and hopefully get some financial assistance. Um, again, up with your landlord early and often. Most landlords do not want to evict, especially right now. Um, if you're temporarily furloughed, you have a temporary reduction in hours. Um, if you know you're headed back to work um, or you're just awaiting unemployment benefits to kick in, let your landlord know. If they know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and you're going to be able to pay rent coming up, um, they're more likely to be patient and let you stay for a bit longer. Talk to them about what they're willing to do to keep you in place. Because keep in mind that if you're having trouble paying rent, others are also. So if you're a good tenant and they wanna keep you there, they're gonna work with you to keep you in place. Um, set yourself up for effective landlord negotiations. Show good faith and do that by paying what you can, if you can. Again, let your landlord know of any expected income coming in and keep your landlord um, up to date on your efforts to get eviction prevention funds um, and the status of any applications that you've made for financial assistance. 
Um, so some ideas to, for working with your landlord in keeping you in place without necessarily paying 100% of your rent. Um, if you expect your loss of income to be short term, you may be able to defer your current rent payments or future rent, rent payments to a later date. Um, your landlord may be, a, may be willing to reduce your rent for a specific period of time. They may be willing to modify your lease terms to reduce your monthly rent. Um, and then you may also want to consider a payment plan for, um, or a waiver if your landlord is willing to do that. And believe it or not, some landlords are willing to forgive past rent um, if you, you get back on your feet. Um, so those are some things you can think about doing. Um, when you start looking at um, an agreement with your landlord, be realistic about what you can do. Don't overpromise. We see this often where tenants will say, okay, so I'm going back to work. So, so as soon as I get back to work, I'm going to pay my monthly rent plus half of my rent again. So, you know, you're paying 150% of rent. Not many people can keep that up. Um, so be realistic, spread, um, spread your rearage over a long enough period that you can make that agreement successful. Um, make sure that your agreement with your landlord is clear and in writing and make sure that it includes any amounts that are waived um, and, and any, things, any, um, any extra charges that the landlord is willing to drop off of what you owe, including your late fees um, or anything else like that, so that it's very clear, so that you're not going to have a dispute down the road over what the two of you have agreed to. So here's something that's really important because both Kathleen and Jonathan mentioned that a tenant holding over action is not covered by either of the moratoria, either the governor's moratorium or the CDC moratorium. What that means is that if you have overstayed your lease, your landlord can tell you you have to leave. And if you don't leave, they can sue you as a tenant holding over. And they can, they can evict based on your refusal to leave at the expiration of your lease. So if you are negotiating with the landlord and your lease has um, expired, so you're just on a month to month or it's on the verge of expiring, you want to ensure with your landlord that they're gonna let you stay after you come current on your rent so that you're not paying six months worth of rent um, that you've saved up or somehow gotten through an eviction prevention program and then you get evicted as a tenant holding over the next month. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, ask your landlord exactly how many months further you'll be able to stay or if they're willing to um, modify your lease to extend it. Get this in writing also. Um, if you've been sued, um, if you have applied for financial assistance through an um, eviction prevention program, request a postponement, both from your landlord voluntarily um, or from the court. The court does know that there are eviction prevention programs out there, and they know that those programs take a while to get through the process so that we can get you some financial assistance. Um, so request a postponement so that hopefully a judgment will not be entered against you. Um, be sure that any agreement you reach, if you've been sued, when you agree to make a payment, make sure that that, it, that that payment will be in exchange for a dismissal of the lawsuit. Make that lawsuit go away once you've paid that money. Um, and if there's already a judgment against you, because the courts have been entering judgments for specific amounts of money, that will not go into effect until January. 
You want to be sure that if there's a judgment against you and you pay money, that the court is aware that that money has been paid so that you can't accidentally be um, evicted when the moratoria end. So make sure that that's part of your agreement. Uh, there are legal resources available. Of course, Kathleen is with Maryland Legal Aid. We have a list of legal resources um, and informational resources on our website at acdsinc.org. Um, we've talked a lot about Maryland Legal Aid tonight as a resource, and they are fabulous attorneys there, um, and Maryland Court Self-Help Centers. But the county executive expanded the legal resources that are available in um, Anne Arundel County to include community legal services. Um, community legal services had been a Prince George's County legal services provider, and they have expanded into Anne Arundel County. We've been working very closely with them for individuals who are in the eviction prevention program who get sued while they're awaiting funds. Um, they're a fabulous resource. Their website is um, clspgc.org and their phone number is there. You can actually do an intake online at their website and they will call you. They really do pick up the phone and call you as soon as you've done that. Um, Anne Arundel County, in addition to the resources that we support, um, we also provide temporary emergency financial assistance. Um, and that's available to help with rent payments and rent arrearages for eligible tenants whose employment income has been negatively affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the general eligibility requirements, you have to be a renter in Anne Arundel County with income reduced as a result of the COVID-19 crisis with current household income at or below 60% of area median income. I'm gonna tell you what, that, what the numbers are in a second. Who is not eligible? If you owe for unpaid rent, before March of 2020, because that unpaid rent is necessarily not affect or not a result of the COVID-19 crisis, you will not be eligible for this program. Um, but you may be eligible for other resources through other community um, community out outlets. Um, but you're not likely going to be eligible for any of the funding that's coming through. Um, the CARES Act or CDBG COVID funds um, because they're, your, your inability to pay or your arrearage is not related to COVID. Um, and the other folks who are not eligible for this program are individuals who are in public housing or HUD, based, um, HUD project based housing, subsidized housing. And the reason for that is um, folks who are in subsidized housing are able to get a reduction in their rent as their income is reduced. Um, so hopefully they're not in need of the funds as um, in the same way that non-subsidized tenants are in need. Um, considerations for tenants in public or other um, subsidized housing with rent-based income for the folks that are not eligible for um, the eviction prevention program, um, they still do have options. So if you're behind on rent or you anticipate falling behind on rent and you're a subsidized housing tenant, if you're in um, public housing at HACA or you're in public housing or project-based housing at the Housing Commission out in the county, don't wait until you're sued for failure to pay rent. Contact your property manager contact housing commission or housing authority of the city of Annapolis, because they have some expanded flexibility in their options to deal with um, folks who have fallen behind due to COVID. They can enter into longer repayment plans and um, do some retroactive rent redeterminations so that perhaps the amount that is being 
claimed or that you think you owe might be able to be reduced or you might be able to enter into a long enough payment plan that you can get that arrearage paid. Again, reach out to them as soon as possible, just like anyone who's in private housing would do. Okay. So going back to the folks who are eligible for financial assistance through the eviction prevention program, income limit is 60% of adjusted median income per HUD for our area. Um, what that means is a household of one would have to be at $43,680 a year or below. And the amount, the maximum income amount goes up from there, depending on the family size or household size. Doesn't have to be a family, can be, uh, you know, uh, anyone, can be roommates, but we go by the household income. Um, you will need to provide um, documentation to establish both your income, your current income, because that's what we're looking at for eligibility, financial eligibility, but we'll also be looking at documentation to establish that you have had a decrease in income from before COVID hit to now. Um, and so, of course, we're looking at um, pay stubs, furlough letters, when you get an application, you'll have a whole list of documents that we'll, we'll need to take a look at. What I will tell you is that if you are applying for rental assistance through the eviction prevention programs and you don't have exactly everything that's on the list, please get your application in anyway. Not completely unfilled um, without all the documents, but if you're missing one or two, please get your application in anyway, and we'll do everything we can to help you to complete all the documentation that we need. Um, additional documents, these are things that either will have to come from the landlord or that you'll need to have. We'll need to see a fully executed lease Mostly we wanna see that front page that's gonna have your rental term, January 1, 2020 to January 1, 2022, whatever, two year, one year, and the rent amount and then the signature pages. And then we'd also need to see either an eviction notice, which hopefully isn't gonna be a um, failure to pay rent complaint, but rather is going to be just a notice from your landlord that you owe money for rent. Um, and then this is a program where the landlord has to voluntarily participate we, because we need tax information, a tax ID from your landlord. Um, the landlord does not have to give you that tax information. They can provide it directly to your case manager. They can provide it directly to ACDS or whatever agency you're going through. Um, but we do need that tax information because payments are made directly to the landlord. Um, there are actually four agencies that are processing eviction prevention programs in the county. Only apply to one, um, Arundel Community Development Services, Anne Arundel Partnership for Children, Youth and Families, Community Action Agency, and the Lighthouse Safe Harbor Resource Center. So my slides include direct contact information for each of these resources. Um, so you can reach out to them. Most of them you can reach out online, but also through the phone numbers. Um, Arundel Partnership for Children, Youth and Families, uh, Community Action Agency, they're at, at, call their number and seek a, extension four. And I just wanna give a plug for Community Action Agency's Emergency Utility Assistance program. Um, they have received some new funding, additional funding um, to uh, provide emergency utility assistance. So if you've got utility issues, um, go to Community Action Agency. And while I'm thinking about it, there's also funding available for um, homeowners, if you're a homeowner, and most folks on here are not going to be, but for water bills. So um, that, that money is out there, will only be available until the end of the year. Um, so look into that as well. Um, 
The Lighthouse through the Safe Harbor Resource Center is also processing applications for emergency rental assistance. And then finally, Arundel Community Development Services, that's where I am. We administer these funds. Um, you can contact us by phone, leave your name, email address, and phone number so we can get back to you. Um, or even better, go online to acdsinc.org and do our online screener. And we can, um, that, that's just a much easier, more effective way to get into the system. Call if you need to, it's not a problem, but um, the best way to reach us is through that online screener. And that is it. I figured being the last person that I should probably whip right through mine as best I could. If anyone has questions um, about the program or what ACDS is doing in the community to try to keep people housed, feel free to reach out to me. My number is here. You can email me um, and I'm, I'm very accessible and we are, we're here to help. That is what our job is, is to keep people housed and help people in the community. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank all of you. Um, we have received a lot of information and I don't know about anyone else listening, but sometimes it feels like a fire hose coming at us. And so it's very helpful to have the resources that you all are including on your slides. Having said that, uh, we have had a number of questions that came in beforehand, and I have received some here this evening. Some of these questions have been answered by uh, your respective presentations, uh, but I would ask that we uh, pay attention to them coming in this way because the answers may not have been as clear or as clearly heard by those who are asking. But I'd like to start with one that, that I find interesting. Uh, someone asked, are there any organizations of volunteers who go to court with tenants who would like support? Is there such an organization? It's such a daunting and frightening process. And, and I just feel the heart of the person who asked this. Is there, I don't know of any such organization, is there? I can say that I have, when I've been to court with clients before, I know that ACT um, in Anne Arundel County has sent advocates before with tenants, just people to go with them and support them. So that's one organization that I know that has done that in the past. I, and I think that if you know someone were to reach out to ACT that they would certainly do that. Um, I'm not sure about other resources just to go. I'm sorry? You're going to Anne Arundel acting together? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, another resource is um, the Center of Health. They um, occasionally provide individuals who are sort of case managers and provide emotional support to um, folks who are receiving assistance there at the Center of Health. Um, uh, Casa de Ayuda, not to be confused with Casa, I don't think, <laughs> Jonathan. Um, and then also there's people, oh, Kathleen, help me. It's people, encouraging something, people. Pep, yeah. people, people encouraging like people. Um, they also provide assistance. They've got, um, you know, folks who are walking with individuals who are in, um, sometimes in crisis or in that situation. So they may be able to provide assistance as well. I think you have to apply for services through, for, from them. Um, yeah. So yeah, you need to reach out to them ahead of time. Thank you. As you can imagine, um, the, the questions tend to deal with those who are most vulnerable in our communities. And so one of the questions that came in ahead of time was how we can help our elderly who are at Bloomsbury Square and are late. Uh, you all have helped us to understand the documentation that needs to be provided in order to, uh, to, for, to stall a, uh, an eviction or um, to get assistance. But for many people, this year has been particularly stressful. And so everyone may not have gotten in the required documentation on time or in good order. So for those who are 
in need and at risk of being evicted and maybe didn't get their paperwork in to HACA or HUD, what is available for them now? So Bloomsbury Square is a public housing property and my suggestion would be that they immediately contact the property manager. Um, some of the guidance that I have read from HUD is that they're being quite flexible um, or they have the ability to be quite flexible with people who have not gotten in their documentation timely. Uh, and I think that that, um, you know, they would have to go through the um, housing authority of the city of Annapolis, but I do believe that um, that hacker would work with whoever it is that that has not been able to get their documentation in timely. Um, they can certainly reach out to our office. We're happy to advocate for anyone that is a HACA tenant that may need that assistance. Um, but um, I think that that HACA is is fairly flexible there, or should be fairly flexible. Right, and if it's more of a social work type help that they need, they could reach out also to the Department of Aging and Disability Services, perhaps to get um, an heirs, uh, what's called an heirs evaluation, um, adult evaluation review services, to see if there's any particular help that um, that individual could be provided with. Perhaps they need a representative payee to assist them in managing their social security check and making sure that their payments get made each month. Um, the Department of Aging is a really valuable resource as well. If I could add to that, I would add as well, contacting Maryland 211. You could literally dial 211 or go on their website as well. And they have a host of private resources from Catholic charities to a number of churches. But if people are restricted from being able to access some of the funds that are grant provided or government provided, then looking out to those private sources for help might be a good way to get caught up when you're behind as well. Following along those lines, uh, one of the questions was what programs are available for rental assistance to the poor who live in Section 8 and HACA housing, also who rent from private sector landlords? So this question is particularly about rental assistance. Right. And again, the rental rental assistance um, is restricted generally to individuals who are not already receiving a, a federal benefits. And so if an individual is if their rent is already being federally subsidized and what they pay in rent is reduced as a result of a reduced um, a reduction in their household income, then they will not be eligible for the, the federal or state grant programs. However, as Delegate Henson said, there are private agencies that, that um, will step up to assist. So you're looking at the churches, Catholic charities, other organizations um, such as those to provide financial assistance. Um, but as I mentioned during my, um, my presentation, people in public housing or um, with, uh, with vouchers or in project-based housing, if they're having difficulties paying their rent, they should reach out to um, their property managers and try and get that taken care of. It can be, their, a repayment plan can be spread over many, at least a couple of years at this point. Yeah, I was going to say as as well. There, the so the other the um, the organizations that were out there pre-COVID are still out there. So Community Action Agency has a separate sort of I guess pot of money that are not connected to the CARES Fund money, and that money is still available to folks who are in um, you know who are in subsidized housing. So and then many there are many area churches a lot of times through Lighthouse. Um, they can also refer you to a lot of the community organizations that help people. And then there are options through HACA or the Housing Commission of repayment plans. If folks have found themselves, themselves behind in the rent, they can work with the uh, public housing agency to enter into a repayment plan to try to get that back balance taken care of. 
And if I just add in one more thing to that conversation, the injured worker protection fund that our county executive put in place, it is a one-time grant of $500, but if a person is eligible and that might be able to be a good resource for him, the CARES money is expiring at the end of the year. And at this point with the change in administration, we don't know what's gonna be next. So accessing those resources while they're available and also at a time where the organizations that are spending the money, they're really looking to make sure they connect it with people who are in need. So while it's not a rental resource per se, if it would be helpful to help somebody that's behind get caught up, that is something that's available and that's through Anne Arundel Workforce Development. We had a question about the Hogan rule. Can someone speak to the Hogan rule? Hmm. I, I think that what um, that rule probably is, we, we actually saw this question on the list and we're kind of questioning what it might be. I think the Hogan rule is the um, governor's order regarding the moratorium. And that is that um, individuals cannot be evicted um, if their income has been reduced as a result of COVID and they therefore were not able to pay their rent. Um, I'm not sure if that is, is, is what that person was referring to, but um, after discussion, that's what we came up with. Um, maybe one of the others would have a better idea on what that might be, but I think that's what the person must mean. Um, in September, management from my apartment community began scheduling eviction court dates for non-payment. Is this legal while Maryland is still in a state of emergency? I realize we've covered this, but if we could be intentional about responding to that one again. Yeah, I'll, I can take a stab at that one. Um, so as I was mentioning, the courts reopened in phases. So there was a lot of confusion. Um, August 31st was the last day that failure to pay rent cases could not be heard. So we saw a big surge in September when failure to pay rent cases could be re could be filed. So that that might be legal. You know, the the a legal brain in me always wants to say that's not legal for a landlord to do. So it's possible that this person might have some defenses or you know, the notice wasn't proper or something like that. But generally I would say um, it is legal to file the cases at least um, from September onwards. Um, and the cases will just be heard later for failure to pay rent. So it is legal for the landlords to file but we probably will not be seeing court dates until sometime in 2021. It, yeah, close enough. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't wanna say like you won't he see a court date um, for like a holdover case. You might see that fairly soon, but for failure to pay rent, you shouldn't see anything until 2021. Already. Um, what is your opinion about a month to month tenant whose landlord was unsuccessful getting an eviction for failure to pay rent because the tenant submitted a CDC declaration, which you all have helped us understand. So the landlord is now trying to evict under THO, uh, even though the real reason for eviction is because the tenant is behind on rent. Is there protection for this tenant? It depends. <laughs> and that has been one of the huge sticking points because it was the, T, the ten, THO is shorthand for tenant holding over. And those are the ones that we've, the, the tenants that we've all addressed at the end of the lease term, the lease has not been renewed, but they've stayed in the property. And so the landlord in Maryland doesn't need a reason at the end of the lease term, if they've given notice to the tenant um, proper notice that they want them to leave at the end of the lease term, then there is no protection per se under any of the current orders. However, um, lawyers are, um, are really fighting back on that because we recognize that that's exactly what's happening. That landlords, be, if they can't get you out on tenant, if, on the failure to pay rent, and you're on a month month lease, at the end of that month, they're gonna, they're gonna give you your 30 days notice and say you, your lease has expired. So 
So I think in those cases, it is best to get legal advice. Um, if you have to represent yourself, maybe a, a lawyer can walk you through it, or if you can get a, you know, if you contact our office or Jonathan's office or whoever's doing those cases, we will make the argument that this in fact is not a tenant holding over case. It is a failure to pay rent case. And we have to see what the judge does with that. And let's just, um, just real quick, just plug um, Delegate Henson's uh, presentation that had such a, um, that would make it the just cause, that you would need a just cause to evict somebody. Um, and that would sort of prevent those kinds of cases from going forward, um, I think, at least in some cases. Do you wanna follow up on that? Thank you. No, that's absolutely right. And thank you for the plug. It does have a list of qualifiers that if the behavior is so egregious and the landlord can prove that, that that is a just cause, but it does require them to at least uh, pre present that evidentiary step of saying that I do have a legitimate qualified reason. That's one of those very narrow exceptions. If they, you know, are a landlord that plan to give the property to one of their relatives or take it offline for rent altogether or any of those qualifiers if those applied they would be able to but it is a it is a high bar to clear to make sure that people are being fair and dealing fairly with the tenant so thank you for the plug Jonathan where do immigrants who may not have all this information get help we know how vulnerable many of our immigrant neighbors feel at all times about anything but particularly with so much going on in this country, uh, many of them are not having access to the help that is available uh, because of fear and lack of information. So where should they start? CASA. <laughs> we are an immigrant and Latino services organization and we are happy to help that community. Uh, that's most 99% of our members are, are immigrants. So mm -hmm. we're happy to help too. Answers. Yeah. And, and there's also the Center of Help in, um, in Annapolis, and they are administering the, they're one of the agencies administering the eviction prevention um, program. They have funds available for eviction prevention. Um, and, you know, a, a person's, an, an immigrants are welcome. Immigrants are absolutely welcome, and they're actually welcome at any of the um, any of the eviction prevention program providers. Um, and if I can just throw in really quickly, because my office will um, kill me if I don't, uh, that um, Delegate Henson reminded me: CARES Act money that um, agencies have has to be returned if not spent by December thirtieth. So folks who need assistance for energy assistance, rental assistance, and other programs, get your applications in, get them in quickly, because remember, they have to still be processed. So folks who get their applications in, in you know, mid-December, toward the end of December, we're not going to have time to process them. And so I, I'm waking up at night with fear that we are gonna run out of time before we run out of money and have to send this money back. So um, get your applications in for help as soon as you possibly can. All right. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding the first part of this question. Um, they have called uh, SCRI does that mean anything to you all? No, all right. Well, the office is closed, they said. Um, they called 311. I'm wondering if they meant 211. A 311, and a person in the Department of Finance told them to keep paying the amount that was given to them by the landlord before their renewal. Um, they got a renewal lease through May of 2021. Will I be charged if the amount changed to a higher amount? So they've gotten an extension on their lease and they're wondering if they can be uh, charged a higher amount. That depends on when the lease was renewed. If it was renewed 
August 22nd or later, the rent cannot be increased by more than um, 3% of the rent. Renewed on May 31st. So that rental increase is okay. Yeah, the law was not made effective. The ordinance in the county was not made effective until August 22nd, 2020. And, so, and it's not retroactive. That is not good news for the person who asked the question. Not good news for that person. Sorry. Well, I thank all of you uh, who sent questions in. Thank you so very much. Thank you to all of the presenters tonight. We have an awful lot of wonderful information, helpful information, and it's wonderful that um, you all are, are making that available to um, those who may have experienced it as a fire host tonight, particularly since we are all so stressed. 2020 has been a year of extraordinary stress for all of us. And so I personally am happy wherever I see grace in the process. Uh, and we do worry about those who are most vulnerable in our communities. And right now that's an awful lot of people. Uh, I have a little bit of good news and that is that uh, Delegate Henson's gave you all some extra time because she came in way under uh, the allotted time to her. So if there's anyone who would like to add one last thing, we have a, a few moments for that. May I reclaim some of my time? <laughs> no, I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Allen, for being uh, such a adept and just wonderful moderator for taking a lot of subject matter and content and really parsing it out for everybody that's on the line tonight. I know that when people contact my office and they're in need of these services, it's a time of high anxiety um, and it can be really stressful. So having a calming influence, present the information, I'm sure makes it easier to digest. And I wanna thank everybody that's on the line for bringing the resources and the information and presenting them in ways that are culturally relevant, ways that are subject matter expertise, ways that kind of go across the board and empower you with not just the knowledge, but the resources you'll need to get ahead and get on top of everything. So I, I just wanna commend all of the panelists and I want to thank Action Annapolis, who, when I first approached them a couple months ago and said, this is what's on the horizon, they have been planning this town hall, having planning meetings, um, figuring out how to get the technology straight, the information straight, curating the panel, really keeping up to date with the filings and the information. So I'm so thankful to have them as partners in this and presenting this. And then, of course, our ladies who are operating the tech, I want to thank you for doing that, for making making sure that we are all seen and heard clearly tonight. And I just wanted to spend that little bit of time thanking everybody because this information is critical. Thank you so much. Indeed it is. Anyone else? Right, I'm just checking the chat here for a second. All right, I don't see any other questions coming in, just some acknowledgements and some thank yous. Again, we thank all of you. We thank Action Annapolis. We thank you, Delegate Henson, uh, for being at the forefront of so much of this. Uh, this has been a very difficult year um, worldwide. This has been a difficult year, and it's been a hard year in this country. And what I want people to leave tonight knowing is that there is help. I took um, CPR training at the fire hall a couple of years ago with my Rotary Club. And one of the takeaways for me was towards the end where one of the EMTs said, even if you feel you can't do this perfectly, do something, do something. There is evidence that people's lives were saved because it wasn't done perfectly, but just keeping that pressure on the heart muscles help them until the professionals could get there. I've never forgotten that, do something. So I would say to those who are listening or watching on YouTube tonight, if you're there, do something. Even if you feel you have uh, missed the deadlines and they're out of money, well, we know that's not true. There is CARES Act money out there. Do something and do it tomorrow. Uh, you've heard our attorney say, don't wait until Christmas day. They won't have time to process it. Go ahead and contact one of these agencies tomorrow and start. Don't give up. 
hold on to hope. Where there is hope, there is life. So do something and do it tomorrow. Thank you for the opportunity to, to moderate. I always enjoy these. And I just wish all of you um, strength and courage for the living of these days. I wish you a full night's sleep sometime soon because I have a feeling you haven't had one for a while. To Action Annapolis, thank you for stepping up again and again and again. And to all we say, take good care, friends. Good night.